So here's our quick review for the exam. Chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 are fair game. Every bit, every little bit of content in those, plus anything I may have mentioned during lecturing class. It's all fair game. Uh, general principles was so fundamental and foundational. There's really no problem that just comes out of that chapter. Chapter 2 on force vectors is pretty fundamental and foundational, and we use it for the rest of the whole semester and into dynamics and into fluids and solids, etc. But there may be a problem or two grabbed out of it. You got a five te problem test, okay? Five problem test. And uh, you're going to have one or two problems. Uh, out of chapter three, so yes, we'll have a little free point diagram, all right? And uh, the complications out of chapter three were things like pulley and cable and ropes and chains and uh, what else? Springs. Springs were real, you know, challenging and tensions and compression forces and... Uh, you then get typically two equations and two unknowns. And you know what? They don't always have to be linear algebraic equations and unknowns, and you still need to be able to solve them on a test. Did I stress that before? Did I say that your calculator should be your really good friend? Then we just finished Chapter 4, and we have one or two problems out of Chapter 4. And then you can start to see, oh, yeah, this is... This is used and reused, the concepts. But chapter four had a lot of moments. And we just finished with the distributed loads. So chapter two, to go back and think about how you describe vectors, you do not have to always describe a vector using Cartesian vector form. But once you get exposed to that, you're addicted to it. You just want to, oh, everything is Cartesian vector, Cartesian vector form. Yes, that'll do you well for 99% of your life. But there's just graphical addition and subtraction of vectors and expression of vectors graphically. Remember the sine law, cosine law, how to do that graphically? Yes, that's all fair game, absolute fair game. Uh, we stick to 2D when we have the graphical addition. But when we move into 3D, well, we're pretty well stuck with uh, vectors in Cartesian vector form. Um, position vectors, displacement vectors. Uh, unit vectors, we use that a lot to express a force in 3D. You know, a force directed along a line. And then we have our old friend, the dot product, and then the next chapter was our cross product, wasn't it? So we need to be very good at the vector A dot B. What does it mean? How is it used? I can't remember. Is that the magnitude of A divided by the magnitude of B? times the tangent of the angle between, what is, what is the, you know what the dot product is. It's the magnitude of A times magnitude of B times cosine of the angle between them. Can that angle be greater than 90 degrees? Yes, it can. Can that angle be negative? What's the range of that angle? Zero to 180, yeah, zero to pi, right? And if I put in a cosine, let's say of, I don't know, uh, I'm going to put 135 degrees, what do I expect that numerically to be? Negative number or positive number? Negative. You're getting so good, right? Yeah. Let's okay. see. All right. Um, let's do this. Uh, how did we use the dot product when we have vectors? It's one is to get the projection of one vector along a line, to get that component in 3D. Uh, or to get the angle between two vectors in 3D. All right? Okay. Um, here's a problem. Here's another problem. Here's another problem. They're all out of Chapter 2. Um, then I move into 3. But let's talk through this one. You have a force. Oh, it's shown graphically. It's in 2D, right? And then what is this force? You have a, a UV axis, not an XY axis. 
and they want to, the components along the U and the V axis. Uh, can you do that? Can you do a problem like that? How would you do it? Try to get a triangle somehow, somewhere, that where one side of that triangle is this force, and maybe you think about the length of that edge of that triangle being represented by the magnitude of that force. And then you have the other sides of the triangle that are aligned with this axis and aligned with that axis. And the first time you see it, you say it's impossible. Well, no, move this one without changing its orientation. And then what did we just do? <laughs> you have a triangle. Is that a right triangle? No. But you have the power of the law of sines and the power of the law of cosine, and you can solve this problem. The cosine law and the sine law, true? And so what would be the magnitude, this, this length of this side, edge of that triangle, think of this one as the length of 150. What is this angle right here? 30 degrees given. The length of this is F of U. The length of this edge is F of V. True or false? How am I going to solve for F of U or F of V? That's what this problem wants, is the magnitude of those components in those directions. All right, common mistake would be F of V is equal to 150 times the cosine of 30. I don't see a right triangle. It looks like your mind's stuck on a right triangle. I'm glad you're an expert at right triangles, but not every triangle is a right triangle. How many people are going that direction? That's a great direction. So the 180 minus the 30 minus the 30 gives you the 120. Is it 120? Ah, I got a little bit of work. I got all my interior angles. <laughs> now you can use the sine law, and you got it. Very good. Thank you for that. All right, let's press forward. Express the force as a vector. Well, where's the force? Sitting down here, applied at point A going up in this direction. Uh, all these illustrations take a time to try to grasp, but what's the strategy for getting this, Carte this force vector in Cartesian vector form? Something in the I, something in the J, something in the K, and all of it being in units of pound. How, how would I do that? What's the strategy? Yes, you definitely get the locations of point A in its X, Y, Z, comma, comma. You can get that for point A. Come up here at point B, get its X, Y, Z, comma, comma. Okay, I got the locations of A and B. Very good. You can get the displacement vector. Yeah, I don't, don't like it. Displacement vector from A to B. That would be a vector. We could get that. Now what do I do once I have that displacement vector from A to B? Normalize it so I get a unit vector from A to B, unit vector A to B. And then what do I do to get my final F over here? Is the magnitude of the force 12 pounds times that unit vector from A to B. Excellent. Uh, will it take you a few minutes to solve either of these problems on an exam? Absolutely. All right, let's go on. Determine the angle theta between two cables attached to the post. What's the strategy for solving for this angle theta? It's there. This is a force going out F1. This is a force going out F2. This is that angle in between. Looks like that angle is greater than 90 degrees, doesn't it? How am I going to solve for that angle theta? Let's use the dot product rule. That's, that's the equation, really, isn't it, that you're thinking of? Yeah. And so if I get a unit vector in the direction of 1, and I dot it with the unit vector in the direction of 2, then it's the magnitude of the unit vector for 1. Oh, that's 1. The magnitude of the unit vector for 2, that's 1 by definition. Unit vector is length 1, unity. 
times the cosine of, hey, the unknown, what I'm looking to calculate. So theta is the arc cos, yeah, A-C-O-S, arc cosine of U1, uh, come on now, please write, dot U2. Is that what you were thinking? Yep. How do I get that unit vector? All right, this one, you have to spend some time looking at the illustration. I'm looking for a unit vector right here going out in the direction of force one. The, the, the 400 newtons doesn't matter to this problem. What, what, what is my unit vector there? Something in the I, something in the J, something in the K. Somebody want to help with one of these three, either UX, UY, or UZ, plus, plus. You got it back there? Which one? So he sees that it's a cosine of the angle between, and you see that there's one of them that goes to the z-axis just given in the problem, isn't it? And so u, uz is the cosine of an angle of 35 degrees. True? It's a little bit of work to get the other angles, alpha and beta, isn't it? This was the cosine of gamma for 1, and that's 35 degrees. Okay, that's not going to be so easy for the other one. It's going to be in a two-step process, isn't it? Try to make something that's visible. Imagine that this vector has a unit length 1, unit length 1, and then when you come and use this 35 degrees, it basically gives you a length that's in the, uz is in the z direction. It's equal to the 1 times the cosine of 35. That was just a review. But I can do a temporary length, and that's the projection into, maybe I shouldn't draw it the whole way, down into the x, y plane. Can you tell me what the length of the projection of unit vector 1 with that orientation into the x, y plane is? What is that length? 1 times sine 35 or cosine of take 90 minus 35, what do you get? Okay. So, but I, I like to, okay, so it's a sign, do you see it's a sign of 35? One times a sign of 30. That gives me the length down here, but I want now to project it to the X and project it to the Y. So if I project it to the X, uh, looking for a different color, what is, what is this use of X? It'll be the sine of 35 degrees times the cosine of 20. Yes, true or false? True? Okay. And then this use of y, I'm going to pause, walk around. I want you to give me uy. I'm sorry the illustration is not that easy. I blew it up as so let me pick it up here, and so what we have is we have the sine of 25, that gives us that projection, and then what we have is we have the sine of 20, which gives us this project part of that length, but then we have to take ownership that it's not in the positive y, 35, yeah, 35, true, did I do that right now, okay, and then we have the negative sign indicating the correct direction. And you go back and you refute, yes, that's in the positive x, and yes, this is in the positive z. Very good. All right. And then you would do the same thing, although I think for this second vector, I think they give us the alpha, beta, gamma. What is alpha for the second vector? What is beta for the second vector? What is gamma for the second vector? Can you... Okay, 45, 60, 120. All right, now let's check. Alpha 
for the second vector, plus beta for the second vector, plus gamma for the second vector, sum up, and I'm going to walk around and check. Are these good alpha, beta, gammas for the second vector? Did they sum up to the right value? I'm going to walk around and check. And my simple answer question to you is, are they right? All right, how many people knew I was throwing a curveball and trying to trip you up? Make you swing at a ball that's way outside of the strike zone, right? Is there anything special about the alpha, beta, gamma that they need to sum up to either 360 or 180? Is there a certain, like, hey, we just did the interior angles of a triangle right here. That's how you figured that was 120. The three interior angles have to sum up to 180, or that's, this is true of all, ang all triangles, not just right triangles, all triangles, true? All right, well, somehow we like to carry that idea across into these vector and direction cosine angles and stuff, but is, does the alpha, beta, gamma have to add up to anything in particular for a good? No, they do not. This is no, no, no. And yet I'll have a lot of students, they try to add them up to 360 or something. It, it, it doesn't work. But what does work? What has to happen? The unit vector has to have unit length. And so if you look at, I'm going to scoot down a little bit. If I look at U2, isn't that the cosine of alpha 2 in the i and the cosine of beta 2 in the j and the cosine of gamma 2 in the k? And if it has unit vector, if, it if it's a true unit vector, its length is 1, isn't then the cosine squared of alpha 2 plus the cosine squared of, I uh, can't write, beta 2? plus the cosine squared of gamma 2, if I add all that up, isn't that equal to, well, if I take the square root, but it's equal to 1, so it's really just 1 squared is 1, so get rid of the square root. The cosine of the angles squared sum to 1. Does this work? Just do I take the cosine of 45? and then square it. Now notice, I, I never liked the mathematicians where they put that 2. But they didn't want to put the 2 over here, did they? Because it's like 45 squared, then take the cosine. No, no, no. If you're tr troubled by this, put a bracket and then put squared. Right? And then the cosine of 60 degrees, calculate it, then square it. And then the cosine of 120 degrees, and then square it. Verify that with your calculators, please. When I walk around, show me. One. You have to do the work. You were ahead of me. All right. So uh, hopefully everybody's convinced, and hopefully that was a good review. Um, this chapter, chapter three, uh, it was some of it's very challenging. Conceptually, it's very straightforward with the three-point or body diagram. But uh, when you move into 3D with springs, it can be really challenging. Coplanar 2D problems. Let's see if I have one. Two identical springs are arranged in series. Is this series? All right. A force of 100 newtons stretches the springs by 8 centimeters. So what moves? Does this point move by 8 centimeters after the load is applied? Is that what happens? How about this point? Does it move by 8 centimeters? Does this point move by 8 centimeters? No. How much does it move by? 4 centimeters because they're identical springs. They have the same stiffness. The springs are rearranged to be now be in parallel. If 100 newtons is applied, what will be the new stretch distance in centimeters? All right. Um, in the interest of time, let me... Let me pick it up right here. If I do a free body diagram right here, I know it's kind of funny free body diagram. Uh, I have a 100 Newton load going to the right. I have a load going back in this spring, a load going back in that spring. 
Um, it could be 25 newtons and 75 newtons. It could be 30 newtons and 70 newtons. But they are identical springs, and they're going to be stretched the same distance. So guess what it has to be? 50 and 50. Is this a guess, or is it with confidence that I know each spring is going to pick up a load of 50 newtons? It's going to pick up a load of 50 newtons each. So once that, I figure that out, isn't it easy? Yeah, it's easy. So what we do is we have each spring as a 50 newton load. You determine your stiffness from up here. And what was our stiffness, K? 100 newtons stretches it by 4 centimeters, or 25 newtons per centimeters, right? That's what you're saying? And so the stretch from a spring, or well, I should have written F is equal to KS, the stretch is going to be the force, the 50 newtons, divided by the stiffness, 25 newtons per centimeter, not needing to guess anything. And so our stretch is 2 centimeters, true or false? We have a spring, it has an unstretched length of 2.4 inches. This is L naught. You uh, put a 50 pound mass from the spring and now it uh, dangles and it has a length of 3.7 inches when it has a 50 pound mass dangling from it. You then introduce a table. So the 50 pound mass, still connected to the spring, sits on the table and it has a stretched length of 2.8 inches. Determine the magnitude of the contact force between the mass and the table. Is there a contact force between the mass and the table? What would that look like? Well, if you did a free body diagram of the table, it would be something pushing down on it. If you did a free body diagram of the 50 pound mass, it would be the table pushing up on it. The contact are equal and opposite. From the perspective of the 50 pound mass, something's pushing me up, holding me up. From the perspective of the table, something's pushing me down. Same contact force, F contact. So you then have the weight. You could draw it like this. Guess what the weight of the 50 pound mass is? 50 pounds. 50 pounds. Did it change because I set it on a table? or dangled it completely by the spring, it's always 50 pounds. That's always 50 pounds. But a lot of students will leave that off of the free body diagram. And there's one other force on this free body diagram. The spring. The force in the spring. And this force in the spring is pulling up. Now, maybe you want to put the force, the weight over here, and they're both all coming away. That's fine. You can do that to make it a nice free body diagram. But there you go. Once you have those three forces, don't forget the weight, don't forget the contact, and don't forget the force in the spring. You can solve this problem. Should I leave you there? Press forward. We just covered chapter four, but there's a lot of material in chapter four. Thank you for your attention. Exam on Wednesday.